Welcome back biology to animals part two. In our first presentation, we mainly went over our invertebrate group, which are the animals that do not have backbones. We are gonna go over our vertebrate group today. Keep in mind that our invertebrate group are the most diverse on the planet. There's more of those on the planet than there are of vertebrates. Our major groups of vertebrates are fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals that you see here on the screen. Uh, if you look at this diagram, you're going to see the major differences that set these groups apart, their characteristics, and that's why they are different and separated this way. So let's talk about some of those differences, and I'm going to use slides again so you can see some of the differences through pictures. So the very first group are our fish group. Okay, You guys, we know that fish are aquatic, they live in water. They are vertebrates, meaning they do have a backbone. And one particular thing that uh, fish have developed are gills. Gills allow them to filter the water and take in the oxygen that they need to survive. Because remember, one of the characteristics of animals is that they need oxygen. Fish also have appendages, and what we mean by that is they have fins. Okay, Instead, they don't have limbs and fingers and toes like we do, but they do have um, fins. Something else, if you've ever caught a fish before and you've actually held it in your hand, they have scales. Okay, and those skills will fall off, but uh, this helps us realize that they're related to birds and also to reptiles because those animals also have skills. The three major groups of fish, there are jawless fish, then there's our cartilage fish, and then our bony fish. Okay, and I'll show you some of the differences with those with pictures. Jawless fish, if you've seen here, these guys are usually parasitic. These would be like your uh, lampreys and hagfish. These guys actually latch on to other fish. They're parasitic. They need a host to survive. Um, and they cause all sorts of uh, problems, like on paddlefish, for example. They'll latch onto a fish and stay on them for quite some time. They can kill other fish, or they'll just cause harm. They'll disattach and then go find another fish to latch onto. But they are considered jawless because they don't have a jaw, but you can see that they have these teeth in like a radial pattern, like in a circular pattern, which allows them to grasp on to their host. Okay, the second group were our cartilage fish. This would be like sharks, stingrays, also um, sturgeon, if you've ever caught a sturgeon or seen one here in Idaho. But these guys are cartilage. They don't have, um, if you know anything about cartilage, that's like what's in your ears and in your nose. It's really flexible. It allows them to be fast swimmers. Um, have you ever seen stingrays and sharks be able to move and turn on a dime? It's because of this cartilage structure in their body. Our third group is our bony fish, okay? These are the ones that we typically think of when we hear the word fish. These would be like our trouts, tunas, uh, clownfish, codfish, many of the fish that we uh, catch out of like lakes and streams and stuff are the types, these types of fish. Um, you'll notice is when you actually eat these guys, you'll come across those small, tiny little bones if you don't debone them before you eat them, okay? So those are your three types of fish groups. The second group we're going to talk about are amphibians. Amphibians, you guys, they can live on land or in water. They have developed the ability to breathe both in water and also out of land because they also um, have gills. But one thing that's really cool about these guys is they also can take in oxygen through their skin. They can uh, breathe through the skin. And the only way they're able to do this is by keeping themselves wet. Um, you'll notice that amphibians are always near water and they have kind of, if you've ever touched or held one, they kind of have a slimy texture appearance to their um, skin and they have to keep their skin wet because if it dries out, they can't breathe through their skin as well and they don't have the oxygen they need. Okay, these guys are cold-blooded. What does cold-blooded versus warm-blooded mean? So cold-blooded means that they cannot make heat uh, with their own body. They have to lie out on a rock or in the sun to get the heat that they need. So it's important. So like if an amphibian goes and collects a meal, they can't digest it very well unless they're in the presence of heat. Um, so that's why they are cold, considered cold-blooded. Where warm-blooded animals, they can actually produce their own heat. Like in humans, our bodies make heat naturally, and this helps us digest the food that we eat. Okay. So let's keep going with amphibians. They also lay eggs, but they lay eggs in fresh water. And you'll notice that their eggs are more gelatinous. They don't um, have a hard shell like you'd see in a bird egg or a reptile egg. They live mainly in fresh water. Okay, and about 88% of amphibians are actually frogs. Okay, 
So let's jump into our reptile group. Reptiles are also considered cold-blooded. They have to have heat for metabolism. Okay. Um, and they will regulate their body temperature using their environment like we discussed before. Reptiles can live in both land and water. You'll see that with like uh, some lizards or different types of iguanas. There will be land iguanas or aquatic iguanas. Um, most of these guys lay eggs, and when they lay their eggs, their eggs have an outer shell on them. And they also have scales, and you'll know that they do not have fur. Okay. One thing about these guys is they also lack external ears. Here's a picture of different types of reptiles. We have everything from alligators, crocodiles, to um, we have lizards, turtles, uh, iguanas. Uh, so these are just an idea of different types of reptiles. If there's any of these that you're interested for your animal research project, um, there's a lot of really cool ones out there. So our next group are our birds, you guys. Birds are actually are very closely related to the reptile group. Um, if you look in terms of evolution, birds actually have scales still. If you look like at their feet that aren't covered by uh, feathers, you're going to see their scales. And underneath um, their feathers, you would also see scales. But birds are actually the first group to be warm-blooded. And I know that doesn't say this on the slide, but I want to make that clear that these guys are warm-blooded, meaning they can metabolize. They have heat. Uh, that is naturally produced in their body. Okay. One other th cool thing about birds is that all birds have wings and not all of them can fly. They also have hollow bones. Okay. This is important because it allows them to be light and allows them to fly. They also have feet and claws and they um, do not have teeth, but instead they use their beak to um, eat. Another thing is they have streamlined bodies. What does a streamlined body mean? It basically means their body is in a certain shape that allows them to fly. So if you look at like at the shape of an airplane wing, it's optimal for um, air to pass over it and allow the airplane to lift. Birds are shaped in the exact same way. Okay, let's go on to our mammal group. Mammals, you guys, are also warm-blooded. What sets a mammal apart from any of the of the other vertebrate group is the biggest thing is they have mammillary glands, which allows them to feed their young. Okay, they can produce milk. Uh, mammals also have hair and they also are vertebrates and they have lungs to breathe. Okay, instead of like in amphibians or uh, fish that use gills. There are three different types of mammal groups. The first one are our monotremes. Monotremes actually are egg-laying mammals, but they're still even though they lay eggs, they still actually feed their young through mammillary glands. They're able to produce milk. Remember, that's the major characteristic of a mammal. There's also marsupials. These guys actually um, have um, a pouch. This would be like a kangaroo. Okay, and then we have placental animals. They have their young in a very unadvanced state. So like these would be like us, you know, cows, dogs. They have a placenta when they make their youth. Okay, the different types of placental mammals. Uh, there's oh, almost 4,000 known species of placental animals. The most common are people, cats, dogs, and horses, a lot of them that we've actually domesticated. But this would extend out to hoofed mammals, um, like goats, sheep. Uh, you also go into things like bears, just anything that you think of usually when you hear of the term mammal. These would be your placental mammals. Uh, the other ones, like I said, would be our monotremes. You guys, these are like... Um, a platypus or a porcupine, anteaters, like I say, they actually lay eggs. Um, when they actually lay their eggs, they will uh, lay them in a nest. Once the youth are born, then you can actually watch them. They will produce their milk and feed their young still in the nest. Okay, Go and see if you can Google or YouTube some of these guys because they're really cool to see how they hatch and how they uh, bear their young and how they take care of their young. The second group I said, or sorry, the other group was marsupials. These guys have a pouch, so this would be like kangaroos and possums. Um, one thing that's really cool about these guys is you can see in this picture that the kangaroo has a pouch and they have a joey. The baby is called a joey. And the thing about it is the mom can be pregnant with a baby and also have a joey at the exact same time. Um, and they also produce milk inside this pouch, and the baby's able to survive off of those mammillary glands.
So you guys, that uh, concludes our animal lectures. Hopefully some of these groups um, have been of interest to you for your animal research assignment that's coming up. And if you have any questions, once again, just text or call.